senses face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me Well, good evening, folks. Lovely to have you with us tonight. Hopefully, are thankful that I didn't scare you all away uh, with a subject tonight. Um, just to mention again that we're meeting in fellowship groups this week, and we have a new book. And so, uh, if you haven't, if you're part of a fellowship group and haven't got a book, you'll find them out in the foyer as you come in. Those are costing us about five pounds fifty. Um, so, you can. Uh, I, th I think it, it just works whereby you just put your £5.50 into the offering. Um, so it's an inexact science, but uh, it's up to you. Uh, also, just to mention our annual report, um, can each organization submit their financial, uh, their financial statement and a short report of their organization uh, uh, to Gareth Kirk by the end of the month? And uh, one thing that's happening this week that's not on the January bulletin is that we have our coffee morning uh, on Thursday at 10 o'clock, and that's just for anybody to come along and have a cup of coffee and cake and chat uh, together. Uh, so let's begin our worship by singing uh, two songs back to back, The Lord is My Salvation and Then There is Our Redeemer. Uh, so again, we'll stay standing uh, for the two songs uh, back to back.
let's pray to the Lord along these themes of redemption and salvation. Our loving and gracious God, as we come to you, we thank you, Lord, that all through the Bible, you are presented as a God who brings people out of trouble and into blessing. Right there in Genesis chapter 3, at the fall of man, you are there, waiting to see man's response and then bringing a better solution, understanding that man could never cover himself up, you provided through the killing of an animal a skin that would cover over his nakedness. Uh, we find it uh, in, in uh, Bible story after Bible story, the kind of thing that's described in Psalm 40, uh, man sinking down into the miry clay and you lifting him up from the miry clay and setting him on the rock and establishing his way and putting a song in his mouth. We think of the words uh, of lostness to salvation. We think of bondage to redemption. We think of darkness to light. We think of deadness to life. We think of mortal man limited by his sin and limited by his days. And we think wonderfully of eternal life. Again and again, many different descriptions describing a God who comes to help us, a God who comes to set us free, a God who comes to bring us into life, a God who journeys with us, strengthening us and helping us through the trials and the fires and the battles and burdens of life unto eternal joy, unto eternal glory, unto a place where all of the problems will be fixed. Father, we thank you for what we've been seeing as we've looked at the Exodus story of a people who are under a cruel taskmaster. You coming, noticing their situation, uh, so uh, moving to bring them out, bring them through the water, uh, feed them through their wilderness journeys and take them to a place uh, where, the, uh, where the cows cannot hold all their milk and where the, uh, uh, wh wh where the clusters of grapes are almost too heavy for the branch, a land flowing with milk and honey. And our Father, uh, we praise you that that's the kind of God you are. Uh, so, Lord, help us uh, as we approach uh, some of the trouble that we get ourselves into, find ourselves in. We pray that we would approach that remembering the kind of God that you are, one that purposes to help us, one that comes uh, to our aid. Help us in our service tonight, we pray. Uh, Father, we just take a moment to remember those uh, in our congregation who are, who are struggling just at the moment. We pray, Lord, for Harry Howell. Pray that you would continue to help him through in Bangor, uh, that you might just so uh, give him the strength and the presence of Christ. Uh, and if, as we expect, these are his later days, we pray, Lord, that uh, you would be coming to get him and that you would be carrying him safe home. Uh, Father, we do pray for May Jewett. Could maybe pray likewise. Thank you for a faithful servant and we pray for her. Pray, Lord, for Helen Morton in a very different way. Uh, Lord, just as she has had this surgery on Friday and we pray that you would uh, strengthen her and help her in hospital tonight uh, and um, just uh, give her strength for the days to come in wisdom as well. We do pray for Ernie and Ellie and Carson.
pray for the folks uh, who have come across from Ukraine and pray for Helen uh, and, um, uh, and some others that maybe uh, we uh, are not just at liberty to mention publicly, but Lord, you know. So help us in our service tonight, we pray, and be with those who cannot be with us. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, lovely to have you with us uh, uh, tonight, and we pray for God's help uh, as we look at the Scriptures together. So I'm just going to read a series of Scriptures that will come on the screen, starting with the catalyst uh, for our subject, which is Matthew 5, uh, 31 to 32. So if you've got a Bible and you're looking up, it comes under this same uh, uh, movement that uh, Nathaniel described to us last week of living as salt and light and a light on a hill and let your light shine before others, uh, and then looks at different areas um, that Jesus wants to clarify in light of some uh, relaxations that the, that the Pharisees have brought in and then this one in 31 and 32. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever uh, marries a divorced woman uh, commits adultery. And then Jesus says something more on this in chapter 19, verses 3 to 9. And there it says, and Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, uh, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then? Did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And then 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verses 10 to 16. Uh, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. And to the rest I say, I and not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she, uh, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are, uh, they, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to, unto peace. Uh, for how do you know whether, uh, how, how do you know, wife? whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife. And then Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if, if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and, and, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then, his for, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord and shall not bring, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. And one last reading, uh, Exodus 21, 10 and 11, uh, speaking uh, in the context of a man who has married a slave woman. And then it says, if he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, uh, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment 
of money. Just another short prayer specific to, to this. Our Father, you lead us into the truth. You have opened our eyes to know the truth uh, and to do the truth. You have, uh, modif- you have so changed our hearts that we want to do what you say. So, Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to understand and a willing response to do whatever you would say through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you'll know by now that I prefer um, ex- uh, consecutive expository preaching, uh, working through a book of the Bible, and that determines the curriculum. It gives us the next text, and it helps us to cover the whole counsel of God. Hopefully, it means that the material is new and fresh uh, week on week. This week's subject is not easy, but I do believe that it needs to be preached, particularly as a ministry to those who have had, uh, who have experienced trouble uh, in these matters. Um, As we approach any subject, we are people of the book. In every subject, we must carefully listen uh, to the Word of God first, and then to commentators after. Um, And as we read the Word of God, Uh, And as we approach any particular part of the Word of God, we are seeking to understand the, the, the just, loving, and compassionate God that is described all throughout uh, the Scriptures. As I preach any subject, um, I, I seek to find the truth in God's Word. And then, and I do this every week, but I will check my conclusions against what others say, what others say in the evangelical uh, church. And of course, if nobody else is saying what I'm thinking, then I'm wrong. Um, uh, Alongside the kind of Bible commentaries that I would uh, typically use every week, this week I have uh, drawn on John Murray's classic book, bluntly titled Divorce, Uh, Murray was no lightweight. He was a Scottish theologian writing from America in the late 1940s. Also, David Instone Brewer, uh, his book on divorce and remarriage in the church. Instone Brewer is a research fellow at Tyndale House in Cambridge and a Baptist minister, and he wrote in 2003. And also a sermon by Kevin DeYoung that you could find and listen to yourself uh, on the Gospel Coalition website, and I am pretty sure that you'll find him clearer than I am. Uh, De Young is one of the best of the current generation of Reformed evangelical uh, preachers. But we have to start at the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God made one man and one woman, and they were joined together. And, and as you would know, initially, all divorce was unconceivable. When God made man and woman, He made no allowance for divorce. Divorce should not have been needed. Uh, And how it was described there was that a man shall leave his father and mother uh, and hold fast to his wife uh, and and, and they shall become one flesh. And if they truly were one flesh, there would never be a problem. We're talking about a new unit where each person prefers the other person more than themselves. And if in a marriage, and, if, and many of you will know this, uh, if in a marriage, or any friendship for that matter, but particularly in a marriage where you're working together all of the time, if each person prefers the other person over themselves, that will be a tight, delightful unit. Uh, as Jesus was questioned about divorce, uh, uh, as we read it there in Matthew 19, Um, uh, uh, and uh, the Pharisees were trying to ask him about divorce, he went back to the beginning, uh, and he said, therefore a man shall leave his father, father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. 
Uh, and then he added this. He said, Where, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, I just want you to notice one thing about that. He did not say man cannot separate it. He just said, let not man separate. The difference being that if, 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 if a marriage was uh, just to make the point that it's that, that, that there is not something mystical going on in a marriage that man could not separate, but man should not separate it. And of course, uh, towards the end of the Bible, uh, towards the end of the Old Testament, Malachi 2. 16, we, we read this blunt statement from the Lord, I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And of course, the Lord speaks as, as someone of experience because he had taken himself, Israel, to be his bride. But Israel as his bride had been unfaithful a generation after generation after generation, again and again and again, and Israel had broken uh, their side of the deal, and the relationship between God and Israel was broken, a bit like a divorce. And so the Lord, in, speak, in saying, I hate divorce, was speaking as someone who had experience of the pain that is caused by it. So we turn um, to the first of our texts, and, and I'm sorry if this sounds like a lecture. There's not an illustration in it, um, I, I, and so it will just come, and I trust it, it. It's not boring to you. I trust that the facts are punchy enough uh, for you to stay uh, with me. But in Jesus' day, in the Jewish community, uh, the Jews had weakened God's law to allow for divorce uh, for any cause. We've seen that uh, in the reading in Matthew 19, uh, where uh, it, it says in Matthew 19, verse 3, the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, uh, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And that's what we want to bear in mind as we look at these verses in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, uh, that they had gone back to Moses and they had seen with Moses that it was possible to get a divorce uh, and they had um, accepted that there, were, that there were conditions for divorce. If the man found some indecency in the woman, then he could write her a certificate of divorce. But by Jesus' day, and there was a school of rabbis after Rabbi Hillel, and they were saying that uh, you could get a divorce for any cause. Uh, they had broadened it out to, uh, to, to, to make it possible to get that for any cause. And so, Rather than finding some indecency, whatever that might be, uh, in the woman, uh, and of course you have to remember the kind of culture that they're speaking into, it had been degraded to such a level that if your wife burned a meal, it could have been seen as a cause uh, for uh, divorce. Any kind of fault could have been cited. It was all too easy. And so Jesus, as he is doing in these other accounts on uh, anger and lust and um, uh, oath-keeping and these types of things in Matthew 5, he is correcting what the Pharisees are saying. The Pharisees are, he, he's saying, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And so the Pharisees are quoting Deuteronomy 24.1, but they are only partially quoting it, and they are leaving out of it the clause, the matter of some indecency. And Jesus then says, but I say to you, so not what you're saying, but what I say to bring you back on track, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Before we go any further, let's just try and 
see what might be included in that, in that uh, phrase, sexual immorality. It comes from a Greek word, porneia, and it was the same word that was used for adultery, for prostitution, uh, for incest, and for fornication, any sort of sex that was happening uh, outside of marriage. And so, uh, Jesus seems to be saying this. Uh, if, if, if uh, let's, let's put names in just to try and imagine it. If Sean divorces Mary for no good reason, and Mary marries again, she will be committing adultery because there was no good reason for the marriage to be broken in the first place. Likewise, if Billy comes along and he marries Mary, Billy will be committing adultery because Billy is marrying somebody who, who, who is still essentially married. But if the, bro, if, if the marriage, and uh, uh, note the order, if the marriage has been broken because of sexual immorality, then it is broken. And if broken, a, a, a certificate of divorce certifies it, recognizes it, legalizes it. And so if Mary, or if, she, uh, anyway, uh, the way I have it in my notes is, is, is the woman, I don't mean to, uh, I don't mean anything by that, but if Mary had been unfaithful, and Sean then decides, and Sean's marriage to Mary is therefore broken and certified by divorce, and if Sean then finds Alice and he marries Alice, it will be okay, it would seem, because the marriage was broken by sexual immorality. Some say you can never remarry, but you should be able to see, I think, the possibility of remarriage in this text because the offense that would happen if it wasn't justified is adultery. And you cannot have adultery unless there's another relationship. And so I think that remarriage is implied. And I think that that's very understandable given the culture and the social security system of their society because without a marriage, typically a person would have no protection. So, um, and if that's not clear enough for you with regards to the remarriage, look at it in Matthew 19, where it says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So out of that passage, I think we get these lessons. Where a marriage has been destroyed because of sexual, sexual immorality, then divorce is permitted but not required. And I put that in there, the, the uh, not required, because uh, it may be possible, even though there has been uh, an extramarital affair or whatever, it may be possible to put the marriage back together again. It will leave a mark on it, uh, but it would be the goal that it could be put back together again if possible. If it's not possible, it it would seem to me that Jesus is permitting divorce. And I believe that in this passage, permission for divorce and remarriage are going together. Matthew 5, 31 and 32. Now, the reason that I cannot just go on then to preach the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is that that is quite narrow and it leaves us with questions. If the only thing that could possibly uh, legitimately break a marriage is sexual immorality, then we're left with a pastoral conundrum. What about neglect? What about the scenario where a man just deserts his wife and leaves her completely? Or what about the scenario where uh, he is abusing her or she is abusing him or there is pain in the house that is unbearable? 
What about emotional abuse? What about control, intimidation, degradation, humiliation, fear that goes on behind so many closed doors? What does Jesus have no compassion for that? I, I believe that Matthew 5, in Matthew 5, Jesus is correcting a, a, a case law, not a statute law, in the sense that he is correcting what uh, was being relaxed according to Deuteronomy 24 verse 1, not making a statute law that would cover every eventuality, and so that's why he's bringing in this correction or this exception about sexual immorality. So, we have to look elsewhere, and we go the, uh, the, uh, the uh, next chunk of material that broadens out our understanding is 1 Corinthians 7. As we go to 1 Corinthians 7, one verse that we didn't read uh, at the beginning of the chapter, verse 3 says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights or fulfill, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And so, uh, we pick up that a marriage includes love. It includes a, 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 a loving marital relationship. Now, depending on the couple's age and health and all sorts, uh, that doesn't necessarily have to just mean sex. It means that a marriage includes a loving uh, relationship. Uh, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, uh, but the wife does. Do not deprive uh, one another. Marital love is not ours uh, to demand. It is ours to give. You belong to the other person. And therefore, uh, you give yourself to them. Don't deprive each other. And also, we pick up from 1 Corinthians 7 that a marriage also involves material support. Verses 32 through 34, uh, later on in the chapter, speaks of the difference between a, a single person uh, and the time and energy that they would have to give to the Lord's work compared with a married person and a married person would be able to give less time to the Lord's work because they would have the anxiety uh, or the interest uh, in, in attending to their spouse. And so, while not explicit about what the anxiety would be involved in attending to your spouse, it does uh, teach us that there is that duty in marriage to care for one another. Uh, and then we go on to look at what Paul has to say about uh, divorce and separation and this sort of thing. And like the Jewish context, he's speaking into a different context. He's speaking into a Roman culture. And under Roman law, a bit like what we have in our culture increasingly now, but, uh, but easier still, under Roman law, couples could, could uh, 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 split up, basically, just separate easily. If you just separated from your husband, that was basically the beginning of a divorce. It was just as simple as, as uh, separation. All you had to do was walk out of the house uh, if your partner owned it, or if you owned the house, then you put them out. And you didn't need to cite any grounds for ending a marriage or for separation. You just had to separate, and that was it, sorted out all too easy. And of course, the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Jewish and Gentile Christians that were part of the church in Corinth were revealing of this freedom too. And that's where verses 10 and 11 come in, where he says, to the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. And we take from that that he's linking back to Matthew 5 and Matthew 19 and the references in Luke and Mark as well. He says, not I, but the Lord, the wife should not separate from her husband. You should not have this, this uh, easy-going arrangement whereby you could just move out so easily. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. 
as I say, it was just too easy for a man, typically for a man, to force his wife out of the house uh, for no good reason. If that uh, type of separation for no good reason happened, Paul is saying that they should either stay in the condition that they're in or be reconciled, but nothing more. But then verse 15, and verse 15 is, is, uh, is, is, is crucial for us. If the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. So, if there's a Christian and a non-Christian married together, uh, and the unbelieving one, the non-Christian separates, and he's not coming back or she's not coming back, then you, you must a- accept it. Now, Paul is not encouraging, uh, uh, and he is not encouraging a Christian and a non-Christian to separate, quite the opposite. Verses 12 through 14, he goes to lengths to say that it's good uh, if one person becomes a Christian and the other person is not yet a Christian, then they should stay together because there's a blessing for the children. Those children are going to be brought up in a holy environment. They're going to benefit uh, from, from Christian influence in the home, and you don't need to be pulling that apart. Uh, don't do that. But if somebody uh, finds themselves in a situation where uh, there is no will to reconcile, there is no will to keep the marriage together, you can just imagine the scenario where somebody is an unbeliever or they're acting like an unbeliever and they have left the marriage. What is the believer to do? 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15 says, in such case, the brother or sister is not enslaved. So, what do you think that means? The brother or sister is not enslaved. If you were reading it in the NIV, it would read not bound. No longer tied to the partner. No longer tied to the marriage. Or free to remarry. Gordon Fee says, uh, a a, a great uh, commentator, uh, he says this is not to say that Paul disallows remarriage in such cases. He simply does not speak to it at all. So, he's saying that the word enslaved does not help us here. David Instone Brewer says the opposite. He says, you are no longer enslaved. You are free from that marriage And as any divorce certificate says, you are free to remarry. I tend to go with the latter, and I go with the latter for two reasons. One, um, uh, uh, remarriage was the default in their culture, because if you weren't married, you were outside of the social security system. And secondly, because Paul is uh, at pains to point out that in this teaching, he is drawing it from not himself, but the Lord. Nowhere else in his his letter writing uh, does he pull in the little clause that he pulls in uh, in verses 10 and 11, uh, not I, but the Lord. And so, it seems to me that he is drawing on and he is pulling all the authority that he can um, lever to assure that this is not his own bright idea, but he is building on the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. And if Jesus is allowing uh, divorce and remarriage to go together in five and nine, Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, then I see that here in 1 Corinthians seven. So, the lessons there are, first of all, and this is important to take with us, though it's not uh, just primary for getting a result out of this text, but marriage involves both love and material support. 
couples who are separated for no good reason should seek to be reconciled or stay as they are. Where a person des uh, deserts their spouse, walks out without a willingness to come back, then divorce is permitted. And the person who has been deserted is unbound and therefore free to remarry. Uh, one more uh, consideration then is Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. Uh, those verses, um, well, we have uh, referred to them, uh, the key uh, sense there, or the, the, the uh, key phrase there, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce. This, this some indecency is hard to trans is, 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 is hard to nail down just looking at Deuteronomy 24. Within an Old Testament context, it seems to refer to sexual immorality or some unfaithfulness in the marriage. But we, we, we draw heavily on the fact that when Jesus was putting it back into the Pharisaical statement in Matthew 5, he brought it back in and called it pornea, which is sexual immorality. And then Exodus 21, 10, and 11, if a man who has married a slave takes another wife for himself, so a man is married once to a girl who was a slave girl. If he takes another wife for himself, now this is case law, not statute law, in the sense that this is speaking to a particular case. If, if a man has a wife who's a slave, and then he takes another wife to himself. He must not neglect the rights of the first wife to food, clothing, and sexual intimacy. If he feels in any of these three obligations, she may leave as a free woman without any payment. I say it's case law, not statute law. Therefore, we're looking for the principles. Uh, and the principle there seems to be, basically, if a man has a girl who is at the status of a slave, and, and even in that type of scenario, if he does not provide her with food, clothing, and love, she's free to go. She has been neglected. And if that was the provision that God was making to the slave wife, how much more for the free woman in a marriage? And so we draw out of this these two texts together that Old Testament law seemed to make provision for divorce because of some indecency translating that as sexual sin and for neglect. Um, and the certificate of divorce, well, think logically about the certificate of divorce in the Old Testament. The certificate of divorce is not God's original design, but if there are men who are pushing women out the door, and they cannot marry again because uh, one doesn't know whether they're married or not, but they're standing outside their own house, then they need a certificate of divorce so as they can marry again and get into a family that will care for them. And so a certificate of divorce, though not God's perfect will, is God's grace to allow a person to remarry and survive in a, in a broken world full of hard-hearted people. So, I'm nearly done. I just want to run through then uh, how we pull all these together. 
I should have said at the beginning, I'll say it at the end, but you're free to disagree with me, but I'm trying, I'm trying to build on the Word of God. And this is what my conclusions are, and I, as I say, I don't stand alone. I believe that this is uh, what is generally accepted in the evangelical church. Marriage is the sacred union of one man and one woman, and it's intended to last a lifetime. And when it's done well, it's wonderful. It was God's design that we would love, cherish, and support each other all our days. And nobody ever stands at the front of a church on their wedding day thinking it will end in divorce. Nobody. Marriage should not be broken. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Kevin DeYoung says, the weight of the New Testament falls on the side of warning against divorce. But when we say, let not man separate, we are not saying man cannot separate. There are occasions when there needs to be a divorce because a man or a woman needs to get out of a house where they are being neglected or abused. Marriages are broken by broken vows and sinful actions, not divorce certificates. You see the difference? Marriages are broken by what happens to break the vows, not the divorce certificate. The divorce certificate is only legalizing what has already been broken. If a partner breaks their vows and is repentant, where possible we should forgive them. It is better to rebuild than to separate completely because you are one flesh. But if the vows are continuously broken without repentance, then the marriage will be left in shreds. Sometimes the sinful actions are so serious that it's the right thing to dissolve the marriage. Where there is the sin of sexual immorality, divorce is permissible but not required in the sense that if you can put it back together, wonderful. Where there is the sin of neglect or desertion, no love, no material support, divorce is permissible but not required. And you'll see in that, if you think about that at all, you will see in that that the whole area of neglect according to material support or marital love is a line that is very subjective and hard to draw. But I believe that the Scriptures teach us that marriage includes love and support, and where they are absent, marriage vows have been broken. And abuse, of course, is not a separate category, I believe, but an extreme form of neglect. And lastly, uh, where divorce is permissible, then so, I believe, is remarriage. And one more um, that's very important. Uh, you, you may have been, or somebody listening to this in 10 years' time, who knows, may have been divorced for some other reason. And it's, it's just too late to go back on it. You may also have been remarried in the period since. 
And your situation could be better described as Humpty Dumpty lying in a heap at the bottom of the wall. I just want to tell you, with all the compassion in my heart, no matter what the story, I want you to remember that every single person no matter what the story, whether marriage, divorce, or some other category of sin altogether, there is never a time when the sinner cannot go back to Jesus and find forgiveness through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. There is never a sin except the unwillingness to go to Him that cannot be forgiven. And I think there are times in the history of the Christian church, maybe we don't have to go back that far. I think there are times when we have made these things into the unforgivable sin. And we have been wrong in that because David was able, Psalm 51, he was able to come back to the Lord and cry out to the Lord after murder and adultery. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me of my sin. And, and I must say respectfully, whatever you have done or however complex your situation is, you will find forgiveness at the foot of the cross. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I believe that what I have tried to lay out to you is widely accepted in the evangelical Christian church. I encourage you as I try to do myself, to go first of all to the Bible. You may well listen to other preachers, and some of you do listen to other preachers, and that's good, of course. I, I just want to say one thing about that. If, if, you, if you are listening to other preachers uh, who have a dispensational understanding of the Scriptures. I want you to remember that a, dis that a true dispensational understanding of the Scriptures will put the Old Testament texts in a previous dispensation and will put Matthew's gospel in a future dispensation. And so, if you take away two-thirds of the evidence, you are likely to come up with a different answer. As you interpret the Scriptures, as you read Jesus and He seems to say one thing, and you read Paul and He seems to say another thing, you cannot pit them against each other. You have to somehow find the harmony between the two of them. And as you read the Old Testament, and you see what the Old Testament has to say, never settle for the New Testament saying something less than the Old Testament, because the New Testament, the New Covenant, is greater than the Old. And let me say then to finish to those of you who are married, positively invest your whole self in your marriage. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Lay yourself down to love the other person. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. We cannot just say that we have fallen out of love 
We need to give ourselves to each other again and again and again, and that means investing in our marriage. At year five, at year 10, at year 20, at year 40. David Instone Brewer says this, when the heat of the passion cools, this is not a, sing- a signal that the marriage is coming to an end, but that the marriage needs attending to. No one sells their house because the heating system needs repaired. No, you attend to the heating system and you keep your house. And as Nathaniel encouraged us last week, take ruthless action to avoid adultery. Do not look with lustful intent. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If you're being, to put it in everyday language, if you're being pursued and tempted by somebody in your workplace, you might just need to change jobs. And if you're getting to too close to somebody in the gym, take out membership somewhere else. Because the pulling apart of one flesh will rip both people. And God hates divorce. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, We thank you for your love and your compassion. We thank you, Lord, for the perfect, the beautiful design of your creation. And our Father, we pray for help to live in a way that fulfills your law, that our marriages might be a city on a hill, a light before the world around us. We realize for many, many, many reasons That doesn't always work. And so, our Father, we thank you for the provision in your word to care for the downtrodden, to care for those who have been uh, oppressed. And our Father, it shows us the loving, generous, compassionate heart of God. As we begin our service, so we finish. The Lord is not one who stands over the, over the afflicted and waves your finger, but one who comes to our aid. And so we thank you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we'll sing just Amazing Grace, a beautiful hymn, and then there's a cup of tea and Uh, refreshments and stuff through in the hall. Love you to stay and chat with us. And if I can speak to anybody personally uh, about these issues that we have raised tonight, uh, then I'd be delighted to do that, but uh, continually just pointing you back to the Scriptures and trying to help you to work it out for yourselves. Let's sing.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of